There you go. Okay, so I was uh, asked to talk about um, two different things. Well, almost completely different things. Um, one is the experiments that Boris Kusov and Bill Meyer, who are sitting over there, and I did this summer on uh, ISS. Um, and the other is a, a um, synopsis, to some extent, of a workshop that I ran at the American Physical Society um, for NASA looking at grand challenges. So the first one I thought was going to be the oldest problem addressed at this meeting. Okay? We're looking at pro a problem packing of spheres, which is at least 5, 10,000 years old. It started when people first had agriculture. And I can certainly beat cold atoms, which are the result of physics that was discovered just about 100 years ago or so. Okay? But I can't beat fire. <laughs> fire beats me by about 100,000 years in, in when, when it became an interesting problem to work on. So I'm humbled. Um, OK, so what we did, oops, is this, uh, does that work? Yeah. It's red. It's does red show up? But it works. OK, okay. so um, on ISS, uh, this cast of characters over there did an experiment on the crystallization of hard spheres. The crystallization of hard spheres has to do with the packing of spheres, as I'll show you. It's an old problem and is the most fundamental freezing problem that there is, the most elementary and the most freezing, the most intuitive, and as you'll see, one that has created a lot of confusion over many years, partly from computer simulations, which now are under control. And basically what we did is we showed that we got a, for us, I'm going to do my hands like this, an enormous crystal, but it's not that big. It's actually looks like a single crystal, of an, a single FCC crystal, face-centered cubic crystal, which nobody has seen before on, on any scale to some extent. They've always seen crystals that are mixed phases for hard spheres. And this was essentially... Uh, two and a half centimeters long, and as far as we can tell, almost perfect. We couldn't find imperfections in it easily. And um, FCC, as indicated here, and I'll show you more about this, simply by confocal mic microscopy slices, which show two faces, a hexagonal face over here and a square face over here. And the other contestants for the densest packing and for the equilibrium structure of, of a hard sphere system um, is hexagonal close packed and random hexagonal close packed and double hexagonal close packed and lots of other things, none of which have these square faces over here. So that's essentially uh, what we learned this past summer. And we're still going to learn more. Now, actually this is below, how do I get it so that uh, I'm all on screen? Maybe I can't. Okay, I'll live with this. Um, I, I can't do it this way, I don't think. Yeah, no, that didn't work. That's okay. A oh. Yeah. oh. Now you can't. Okay, I'd have to move it closer. Anyway, that, that's fine. So, um, what, we, what we did in, uh, I think, almost two years ago. It was supposed to be at the AP American Physical Society March meeting um, in 2020, but um, that was postponed. That meeting was canceled, so we had it the following summer. And the idea was, it turns out that NASA was one of the first agencies to discover that there was interesting science to do in soft matter, okay? And so they were a main funding agency for several decades. And they sponsored experiments on polymers and colloids and emulsions and foams and other things. And there were all sorts of interesting phenomena that were studied, um, continue to be studied. Uh, they wanted to know, the idea of this was to find out, well, what's next? What are we going to do? That was last century. What are we going to do in the 21st century that's really new, right? And um, the basic idea was non-equilibrium phenomena. Equilibrium phenomena are 19th, 20th century 
it's a solved problem, okay? Non-equilibrium phenomena, there are no rules, right? All we know is sometimes Newton's laws work. Sometimes they don't, okay? In particular, for example, one of the new things that people are studying in soft matter physics are what are called non-reciprocal interactions, okay? So reciprocal interactions are Newton's second law. If I have a force from this on this, I have the opposite force on this from that, right? Okay, but that's not always the case when you deal with active systems, with non-equilibrium um, uh, non systems. For instance, if somebody's chasing you, you're repelling them, that is you're trying to get away from them, you're moving in one direction, and they're chasing after you, and you're both going in the same direction rather than going in opposite directions, which is what Newton would say. And that's because there are other forces when you have non-equilibrium phenomena going on. Okay, so there are all sorts of um, new ways of making materials. Um, most, what we found is that aside from a theme being um, non-equilibrium phenomena, another theme that came up, which we'll, I'll, I'll go further into later, is artificial life. Because it turns out soft matter physics is essentially studying how the materials that make up life work, right? And how with non-equilibrium phenomena you may be able to get something like life rather than biophysics, which is something which tries to dissect life and find out mechanically how it works. Okay, so some of the things we found are you can make different kinds of materials. DNA is a great tool. DNA now is a glue. People, you can buy DNA from lots of different companies. You can put it on plastics. You can put it on emulsions. You can put it on colloids. You can put it in gels, okay? And the big advantage of DNA, as you know, it only binds specifically with its complement. And so you don't have to design new chemistries to get things to stick together in different ways. You can just buy DNA, attach it as, you know, attach it specifically to your materials and assemble the materials that way. So for instance, you can make, um, let's see, does this, does this run? Oops, this doesn't control it. This controls it. No, that's not what I wanted. Okay, let me go back. I don't have control from this. Anyway, so you can string emulsions together. I'm going to show you some stuff with that. You can study um, folding problems. You can create things, new materials, by folding linear chains. You can also fold sheets. You can also learn from that about how proteins fold. Um, this is something that's really recent. This is uh, the work of one of my colleagues, Dave Pine, who it turns out the best materials for making photonic band gaps are a diamond lattice. But you have to make a diamond lattice on the scale of microns, and the standard thing to do to make things on a micron scale, as in the experiments that we did this summer, is to use colloids. But hard spheres won't do it. They'll make you an FCC lattice, which is not a diamond lattice. And a diamond lattice is really a, a, a very sparse lattice, right, because each particle has four neighbors, which is a very, very low number of neighbors, okay? But using DNA, um, they made this crystal, and it's not great, right? These, this is maybe, uh, let's say, 40 microns across by 40 microns. What we found in microgravity this summer is you can make colloidal crystals that are much, much bigger than that when you get rid of gravity. Gravity is, is anathema to making big colloidal crystals. Okay, another theme that came out was, uh, aside from new materials and non-equilibrium, is machines made out of machines. That sounds kind of funny, right? But of course, you are a machine made out of machines, right? Every one of your cells, okay, is effectively a machine. It has metabolism, it's transducing work, energy, chemical energy, different kinds, right? And then you're built upon the collection. On an elementary level, there are several examples of this which are coming up. Again, I can't do it with this. So this last one here, I'll show you more about later, but these are, oops, actually I can do it like that, are particles which spin, 
okay? The little magnetic particles which spin, it turns out if you have an induced dipole and you rotate it in plane, you get an attractive interaction. If you rotate in three dimensions, you get nothing, okay? But in two dimensions, you get it. You see these guys form a liquid. It's what's called an odd liquid, and we'll see more of this later, in the sense that when you push it in, it shears. It moves in a shear direction. It's odd in the same sense that a Hall resistance is, hot, is odd compared to, a, it's an off-diagonal resistance. And in the same way, this is an off-diagonal elasticity and viscosity. And we'll see more of that later. Okay, so let me get started instead of spending all my time on the first slide. Okay, here's the old problem, okay? So this is a sphere packing problem. Monodisperse uniform hard spheres, no interaction between them except that they don't overlap, okay? They have excluded volume effects. Um, let's see how I can do this. So um, this, oh, we're missing, yeah, now, now we're missing the top. Anyway, the important thing is Hales. Um, so uh, the problem, as you guys probably know it, for the densest packing of spheres is, is called the Kepler conjecture, because he was paid by the British government to see how many cannonballs he could get on naval ships, right? Um, the solution to the problem um, was first sort of done by Gauss, who showed that among lattices, the FCC lattice was the densest lattice, and the proof that you didn't have non-lattice structures that could beat FCC was done by Thomas Hales. Um, in 1994, the proof took 10 years to pass the referees, because it's partially a computer proof. Okay, so uh, in one dimension, you just touch your particles together in a line over here, if you now want to go to two dimensions, what you do is you stack the lines on top of one another, but you don't stack them one center above the other. You slide it over so you fit in the spaces here below the first one. And that gives you a hexagonal lattice, and that's the densest packing in two dimensions. If you want to go to three dimensions, you do the next thing, which is you take this layer and you stack it on top, but again you play the trick okay, that you don't place it directly on top, you slide it over into the interstices underneath, which means you put that sphere, let's say, over there, over there, and that sphere over there, and that sphere over there, but you have a choice because you could have put this guy instead of, let me see where I am, instead of putting it from there to there, okay, from on top to there, you could have gone that way. So there are two ways of doing it. So there are three separate planes in stacking. And if you make the stacking um, A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, as we'll see later, that gives you the face-centered cubic structure, which is the most common structure of the elements, okay? But if you go A, B, A, B, A, B, you get hexagonal close packed, which has exactly the same density, okay? but is, um, this actually is maybe the third dense, uh, most common of the elements. But in any you have that choice, and in fact, you get the same density independent of how you stack them. You can stack it A, B, A, B, that's hexagonal. You can stack it A, B, A, C, that's double hexagonal close packed, which is lanthanum structure. You could also do A, B, A, A, C, B, as long as you alternate layers don't have the same thing. Okay, so that problem is known. Um, it was known for thousands of years. As soon as people had fruit, grocers knew immediately that the way to stack the fruit best, okay, is this FCC structure. And it's still used, obviously, by grocers. So that problem, even though it wasn't proved, proven, was known, the answer was known for literally thousands of years. Now, if you look at the side over here, let me see, do I have this right? No, I don't. Anyway, if you look at the, um, yeah, I do. You can't see this, uh, what's shown below. Um, if you look over here, 
you get what happens if you take your particles or your fruit and you just pour it into a box and you don't order it, either by a special protocol of shaking or by placing them down one by one. Okay? And this guy over here um, it was studied in the last century by Bernal, who thought that it was the structure of liquids, which it isn't. Okay? But it was called random close packing, RCP. Its density is lower. FCC packs the 74%. This packs the 64%. And this is an equally old and important problem, especially in Mesopotamia when agriculture came around, because before they had scales, they sold fruit or seeds or whatever by volume. And if you could find a way to pack less dense than this, right, then you'd sell more stuff, you'd get rich, you could buy your neighbor's farm. It was important. And it's even mentioned in the Bible. It's even mentioned in the Bible that it is wrong unless you press down and shake together your stuff to get the densest packing, okay? So this is, is an equally old problem. This one is not understood the way that one is, okay? The, the densest packing is well understood. This one isn't. Um, just to give you an example, there are two papers here, one of which you can't see, which is from our group, which was a FISREV letter in 2021, uh, which, had, which was right under this one. It's 38002. That's our work. There you go. Okay. I can't stretch it down. Anyway, but you should note that this is, you could tell that this is an interesting problem because this paper that was just before ours has as its senior author Giorgio Parisi, who was the, one of the guys that won the Nobel Prize this year in physics. Okay. Um, so these ancient problems, you know, are still of interest to fairly good people. Anyway, I don't count myself among them, but Parisi is. Um, okay, now why is this interesting? Why is it interesting that the disordered is less dense than the ordered? And by the way, it is an interesting problem as fundamental as, as asking whether the ground state of physical systems is intrinsically ordered or not. The question you could ask is, for monodispersed particles of any shape whatsoever, do you ever get a disordered, disordered phase, which is higher density than an ordered phase. And nobody's found something like that yet, but nobody's proven that you can't have it. Here's why it's an interesting problem. And again, the top is cut off here. What's supposed to be up on top is something that you all learned in public school, which is the ideal gas law, which is PV is NKT, right? And everybody knows that. And that's for an ideal gas. An ideal gas is point particles that pass through one another. When van der Waals, and it should also say van der Waals up there, um, when van der Waals first started looking at interacting gases, he said, well, you can include attractive interactions, but the thing you ought to do first, the first thing to consider is that particles take up volume even classical particles, okay, aside from, well, that's, it's, all, it's all related, of course, to quantum mechanics. But in any event, classical particles take up volume. There's excluded volume. And therefore, what van der Waals said is, well, the first thing you should do is you should say the volume that you have to move around in isn't the volume of your container. It's the volume of your container minus the number of particles times their volume. And if I factor out the V from this, this becomes 1 minus phi over phi C, where phi C is the densest packing, right? So what that tells you, according to this, when I just divide through, is that closer? Is it close enough? Let me just see. Yes, almost close enough. You can also raise the front, right, with that, with that. Thanks. Sorry, anyway. Um, <laughs> 
too much of a problem. Actually, can't you, can't you change the, doesn't the lens change in front? <laughs> it's a back Absolutely. <laughs> no, I don't think it's bad as, as far as fire though goes. That's hard to beat. But that even beats the bow and arrow, I think. Fire. Anyway, um, okay. I think, I think that's good enough for now. Thanks. Okay, so here's what happens. What this thing tells you is um, if the volume, for, this diverges, the pressure diverges at the, just as you approach the critical packing density. Okay, so if I have a disordered system, like the, the spheres that I didn't put down in ordered form, the pressure diverges at 64%, whereas the ordered state it diverges at 74%. So somewhere these guys cross, and for sure, as you approach 64%, your pressure is higher in the disordered phase than it is in the ordered phase, in the crystalline phase. So the particles actually get pushed by pressure, okay, from the disordered phase to the ordered phase, where they have more room to, more room to move around, okay? And that essentially, you could do the same argument in terms of entropy. You can say, well, the the higher density phase, uh, the particles have more room, if they organize in that way, have more room to move around than they do when they're jammed, if you like, in the disordered phase, because they're essentially getting close to 64. So the entropy is higher in the ordered phase than the disordered phase because of the free volume. Anyway, the pressure drives the liquid to the crystal. That says that somewhere before you reach 0.64, you have to form a crystal, okay? And that's the easiest, most fundamental freezing transition there is. It just involves entropy. So people looked at this and they made a phase diagram from simulations, okay? And up to about 1995, the phase diagram looked like this. Here's random close packing, okay, that's 63, 64. Here's crystal close packing, 74. Somewhere before you get to 64, you're supposed to go to a crystal, okay? And you have a liquid up to about 50%, a crystal above, coexistence in this region. And um, they also had in the phase diagram from the simulations, a glass phase that was in there somehow things got stuck and it became glassy. Um, okay, so that's what the simulation phase diagram looked like. Okay, so there were experiments. The experiments in the mid 80s, this classic experiment by uh, Peter Pusey and Ben Megan, um, looked at colloids, okay. This is backwards, the low density is here and the high density is over here. There's a liquid over here. This is coexistence over here and over here, over here. Here, it's all crystalline. You can tell that it's crystalline because when it's crystalline, you brag scatter visible light because this, the, the unit cell is, has, is like the wavelength of light. Okay, so the colors here are brag scattering. Here you see the, a, less, a, a, a phase floating above another phase. This is crystal, this is a higher density, so they called it a glass, because supposedly it was rigid. Um, and that's what the phase diagram looked like. Okay, we decided to try it to get rid of this gravitational sedimentation and do it in microgravity. So there are a bunch of experiments that were done in the early 90s, I guess, to mid 90s, um, on um, the shuttle. This was phase, this was one of them. Colloidal disorder order transition, gelation was another one. Here is what our phase diagram looked like. So again, it was liquid down here. You can see crystallites growing here. Actually, the crystallites in microgravity grow differently than they do in gravity. In gravity, you have nucleation and growth from sort of spherical uh, centers. That's the classical nucleation growth. Here, there's an instability and you get dendrites growing first. That wasn't so interesting here, it was startling, but it wasn't as interesting as the following. As we went up here, everything crystallized. There was no glass phase that was observed. And in microgravity, no glass phase has been 
seen since these experiments as well. Okay, um, this is the uh, dendritic growth. I won't spend time on that. This is a sample. It turns out when we got these samples back down, and that experiment only did the following. It only took different concentrations in these tubes and took pictures of them in microgravity as they crystallized or did what they were going to do. Okay, the only one that survived was one of the really high density samples, well, 60%, okay, that survived landing and without melting, without being shaken up and melting. Of course, you know, on reentry, there's lots of, it's not micro G anymore. So it turns out the whole thing was crystalline. And we thought, well, we better check this guy out because maybe we got the concentration wrong and stuff like that. And maybe there really is a glass at this high density. Okay? So once we had the sample back on Earth, we didn't want to remix it because if it only crystallizes in space, we'll get it back, right? For another 10 years or something like that, the next mission we have. So what we did is we mixed half of it, the bottom half. And the bottom half, you can see, is clear. It's clearly a uh, solid, okay, how do I know it's a solid? This is the stir bar, and the bottom of the container is down here, and this has been sitting over here for about a year, at least when the picture was taken. So this is solid, okay? We see the, the crystal grow into the glass, so the crystal's more stable. So ever since those experiments, this is not an anybody's phase diagram, even in the simulations. Now, I don't want to say that what we did is we got the, the simulators to, uh, you know, decide this way or change the simulations. It's simply the fact that by then the computers were much faster and much higher, higher memory so they could do bigger systems, okay? And so they found, in fact, that they were wrong that, that in, um, in, even in simulations, you don't see a glass anymore um, for monitors of first crystals. So here's what I was telling you before. If I look at the stacking of this, the densest stacking, I can do it two ways. So here's a layer, a hexagonal layer over here. I've got another layer on top of it which sits, let's say, covering these holes. That's uh, A with B on top of it covers the, the, those, the holes that are covered here. If I slid down the other way with the next layer, I cover up those holes, and these guys would be open up so I could see straight through. And so if I do ABC, I block everything, and this ABC, ABC, ABC is the face-centered cubic structure. And if I just do AB, AB, I'll get a structure which looks like this, which has holes through it and has nothing that looks like a cube in it. Over here you can see this cube, okay, with a square face with a particle in the middle of it, right, and that's indicative of an FCC lattice. And all the experiments that were done before, including Pusey's experiment, okay, the classic one that started a lot of this, was random hexagonal close pack. That is, the layers were randomly stacked. Okay, so here's our experiment in space. The objective, here are the people. There's Boris over there. There is Bill over there. Um, I'm over here. The experiment was done um, with a confocal microscope. A confocal microscope is a scanning fluorescent microscope. So it has, um, it's a, it scans usually in the plane, and then you can lower it and focus on the next layer and scan so you can get 3D images, you can get stacks. The sample cell held three samples like this. The samples were capillary tubes that were maybe uh, five centimeters long altogether, two millimeters wide, and 0.2 millimeters thick. Um, the confocal was mounted in the fluids integrated rack. Um, and let me see uh, whether I can do this. This is, this is what was really cool, but I get a little bit dizzy in this one when I, see, when I let the movie run. So here is what I'm showing you. This is one end of the sample. This is the other end of the sample in the capillary. 
from scans. What we did is we did overlapping scans, interpreted, th thankfully, and pieced together by Boris's student. So here you see the overlapping region from one to the next, right, from one to the next. And the amazing thing here is, well, look, um, first of all, you can see the hexagonal pattern. So it's clearly got a hexagonal pattern in these planes. Next, what you can see is the orientation is approximately um, aligned with one edge of the, of the capillary. Now, as you go down, okay, here what you see is still overlapping, still hexagonal, and essentially aligned with the, bat, with the bottom of the capillary. Here again, that's what you're seeing. All the way overlapping, one to one, all the way to the other end of the capillary, right? Oops, nothing there. Okay, there's a little bit of tilt, if you like. That's just a long range distortion of the crystal. It's like a system, if you do magnetism, which has spin waves in it, right? There's some rigidity that you can, uh, some elasticity you can pay to, to change the orientation slightly as you move down. So, it's hexagonal. It looks essentially like a single crystal. There are probably defects in there, like dislocations. There are no disclinations in it. Um, but they're really hard to find, and there aren't many. Okay, so now I want the next. Now, I have to also, this one also drives me crazy um, if I let the movie go. But the cool thing here is with the confocal, you can take stacks, right, different layers. And then you can put them on top of one another, right, and now you can rotate them with standard software, right? And so uh, this is 20 stacks, okay, and what you can see, oops, and if I can do this, and what you can see here, I stop it, is that you can rotate, when that's looking at the 20 stacks edge on, you can rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, and here, oops, did I pass it? You can get a cut at the right angle where you see the, do you see it? Where you see the square lattice coming into focus. You have to catch it just right, okay? And that's what's shown over here and over there, I guess, right? And that means when you take it and you rotate to the right angle, and the angle is well-defined for FC, FCC, you see this fourfold symmetry, which you would never see in the random packing, in the random hexagonal packing, or in the HCP. So, um, let's see, did I write this down somewhere? Oh, I, did, I forgot to emphasize that. It turns out that, uh, what, how much time do I have? Am I running out? Uh, take five more minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. So I spent much yeah. too. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Anyway, so now that we can sort of, now that uh, at least they, it's computer simulation got rid of the glass, we let them find out, try and find out which is the stable phase. The density of HCP and FCC is the same, but it turns out FCC beats HCP by two parts in a thousand. Very, very small difference, okay? Nonetheless, okay, what you see is that this guy, okay, um, is showing you that you've got a hexagonal plane, You've got the square plane here. That's like looking at this surface and this surface of the crystal. And so FCC crystal actually is, true, is right. And um, we now can believe simulations, even to that accuracy. They, they've, finally, the picture is finished and done with. FCC is the stable structure for hard spheres to this ancient problem of hard spheres.